got an email years ago from a minister who was in his late 40s, had been to seminary, and he said, I read one of your books and I was inspired and thought about, wow, the power that there is in corporate prayer. I'd like to start a prayer meeting in my church, but I've never been in one. Can you help me? So let's talk about that today. Now, one of the things that prayer meetings are associated with over the centuries is revival. Revival is a subject that has deeply interested me for a long time. Ever since I went in the ministry, I've been a student of revival, historic revivals, uh, what the word revival means. You know, revival doesn't mean a series of meetings. An evangelist comes in and is there for a weekend, or back in the day, they would be there for a week, and oh, that's, it's revival meeting time. Well, that's not what revival is. Revival is the stirring up, the fanning into flame, something that already is alive, but has almost gone out and become extinct. Revivication, revive. It's not evangelism. When you have a revival, you don't have evangelism being done, although revivals always have led to evangelism, powerful evangelism. But a revival in itself is about the church, the people of God. A pastor can have a revival. A choir can have a revival. A local church can have a revival. Which means they get tired of the same old, same old, and they want God to show up now in a new way. Some people have defined revival as a return to the manifest presence of God where God the Holy Spirit now begins to make himself known in powerful ways, sometimes soft, sometimes loud. But there's a revival, there's a new interest in God, a new awareness of eternal things, of invisible things, of the things that God has promised in his word. That's a revival. And all revivals have been preceded by the same thing throughout history, and that is by prayer. There have, been, there have been times like the Great Awakening. It's a great thing for you to study. I highly recommend to you to start building a library around revivals, the Great Awakening, the Second Great Awakening, the Welsh Revival, the things that God has done uh, throughout the centuries when people began to really reach out to him and say, no, we're not settling for this anymore. When I went in the ministry, I knew I needed a revival the church needed a revival. It was just, it was on life support. And we began to emphasize the prayer meeting. That's another story for another episode, but we began to emphasize, let's gather together to pray that God will come. Well, no, God's already there. Uh, I know God is everywhere. He's omnipresent. But in revival, God makes himself known in glorious ways. Do you want that? That's the question. Do I want that? Do we feel we need it? Oh, do we not need that? Do we not need that in this country today, churches to be revived so they shine brightly and they carry out the purposes of God that he has planned uh, for them? So now, a prayer meeting. People have visited our church over the years and actually sat in the prayer meeting where I dim the lights on, 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 on Tuesday night. So people who come early, the, the doors open at five, but people pile in there and the lights are dim. And I have some quiet music playing before we actually begin. And they've taken notes. Oh, he dims the lights, he does that. But there is no formula for a prayer meeting. God has to lead you on how you're to begin a prayer meeting that you feel is going to be essential if you're going to move in to the fullness of the blessing God wants for your church and my church. So how to begin a prayer meeting? Many times people have come. This is very practical, the things I want to talk to you about, things I've learned by observation, mistakes I've made. So people go, oh, we're going to start a prayer meeting. The pastor gets up, we're starting a prayer meeting it's going to be amazing. Come on, everybody. And the church doesn't seem to be ready for the prayer meeting. 
So out of a congregation of 400, let's say 60 show up to this well-advertised, hyped-up prayer meeting. We're turning the corner, the pastor says. Well, the second or third week is down to 30, and then two months later, there's about 11 people, mostly ladies, meeting. And it, it, the word gets out. It's like, wow, what happened? This was going to be the thing. So then that's like a double whammy because now people feel defeated. So, and the pastor can get discouraged. And this is why there aren't prayer meetings in most churches. The pastor does not want to have a sign of weakness. Wow, my building had 400 on Sunday uh, and now, you know, 11 people. Although 11 people praying, oh my, nothing wrong in that, is there? But it shouldn't be that way because God's house, as we learned in another episode, shall be called the house of prayer. So what to do? Here's what I found. Don't copy anyone, but get before the Lord and maybe consider some of these uh, suggestions I'm making. Why not start preaching a series of sermons about the power of prayer? What are the verses in the Bible that talk, us about, talk to us about the power of corporate prayer? like when Peter got arrested and was in prison, and the church shut down everything, and they basically prayed him out of prison. Or how about wayward children? And that God will answer the cry of his people when we gather together to pray for the prodigal sons and daughters that most likely exist in your church. If people don't pray about their wayward children, then you gotta wonder if they've ever been born again. Because prayer, Oh my goodness, what would we do without prayer when we see the needs in our own family and culture and state and city and whatever? So the idea of building faith in the people, so a lot of people don't believe in prayer. They don't even know what prayer is about. There's great biblical illiteracy in, in our country today. So when you start to preach about the, the power of prayer, the efficacy of corporate prayer, it can build faith. And then when faith is built, people are not going to say, oh, we have to pray. They're going to say, wow, we can pray. We can call on God. The other thing is possibly even before you start a separate night for a prayer meeting, why don't you consider changing your Sunday service? How do I mean? I mean, maybe preach shorter and leave time at the end for people to pray at the end at an altar with trusted leaders there waiting to stay with them and pray. Especially if you don't have multiple services, uh, that is a great idea. Or stopping in the middle of the meeting and having extended times of worship and prayer. You know, you don't have to go by a script. You can just lead the people to pray. And then when God begins to answer prayers, which he will, now the word gets out, wow, Bob and Sue's uh, daughter came back to the Lord. That's the, what they had been praying for. Oh, my goodness. It'll spread like fire. Speaking of fire, revival has to do with fire. You know, there's a new warmth. There's a new heat. Remember the church at Laodicea. Now, there was a church that needed a revival. It was neither hot nor cold, but it was lukewarm. The exact thing I'm talking about. It was Christian but it was in pitiful condition. It needed a revival. Now you remember in Matthew 3, John the Baptist said, look, I baptize you with water, but the one who comes after me, he's not baptizing in water. Did you know that Jesus never physically baptized anyone in water? No, the disciples did that for him. Why? The one who comes after me, John the Baptist said, he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and in fire and with fire. Fire brings heat. Fire penetrates. When there's revival and the Holy Spirit's fire is there, the sermons actually get to the bottom of things. Sin is revealed. There's revelation from the Word of God. It's not same old, same old. It's not legalism. It's not screaming and yelling. It's fire. Fire penetrates. You know, water and oil are symbols of the Holy Spirit. But if you put that on the Bible, it'll just be wet or oily. But you light a match to this, it penetrates to the core of things. Do we not need that? 
with lifestyles in the church basically the same as with people who don't know God, don't love God, don't want God? Do we not need something that will penetrate? Trite three points and a conclusion sermons, we have enough of. I've preached enough of those. We need fire that penetrates, that brings light and heat. And the great thing about fire, too, it spreads. It spreads. Water doesn't spread. Oil doesn't spread. But fire, you put this on fire and you start touching things in this room, we set this whole room ablaze. That's what fire does. When Christians are on fire, they begin to talk about Jesus and the name of Christ is glorified. So how about it, leaders? In, in your own way, as God directs you, I give you no formulas. Don't we need to see a return of the church of Jesus Christ that you're involved with become a house of prayer? Let's believe God to do great things and answer to corporate prayer. Amen. Amen.